Go for the two.com in with the week seven predictions before I get into the picks for this coming Friday and Saturday night. This Saturday, October 12th, live from the Sports Grid studio inside the FanDuel Sportsbook at the Meadowlands, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern. College football today. I'll give you all my best bets that are on this video, along with the other top 25 games and some under the radar games that I have my eye on as the week progresses. Stream it live at sportsgrid.com, sportsgrid.com, or go to Zumo, X U M O, channel 719, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern. College football today. Check us out. We have you covered for kickoff. Let's jump right into the picks for this coming Friday. Pac 12 battle between Oregon and Colorado. Oregon got a gutty 17-7 win over Cal. They opened up as a 20-point, 18-point favorite. They bet it up to 20-and-a-half in that matchup. Cal did get the cover and did have the lead at the half, 7 to nothing over Oregon. But credit the Ducks for making halftime adjustments. They shut down Monster in that offense in the second half and did outscore Cal 17 to nothing to pick up that victory last weekend in Eugene. They now face another Pac-12 opponent the week before they have arch rival Washington on deck. Oregon's got to travel October 19th to Seattle. Is there a possible look at in that battle? Oregon has opened up as a 19.5 point favorite. It's up to 20.5, but I clearly think Oregon is the better team in this matchup. Colorado coming off a disappointing 35 to 30 loss at the hands of Khalil Tate and Arizona. They now go on the road to face a high octane offense in Oregon. Justin Herbert's completed 71% of his passes, 1,341 passing yards, 15 touchdowns. One interception, but the front seven and defense of Oregon is why I like the Ducks in this matchup. Oregon only allowing 95 rushing yards per game, holding opposing quarterbacks to 168 passing yards each and every week. And that's why I like Oregon to cover this number and dominate this matchup. Also, not sold on the secondary of Colorado. They enter this matchup allowing 300 passing yards per game to opposing quarterbacks, and that's why I favor Oregon and their offense and their quarterback, Justin Herbert. Look for the Ducks to open and extend this game. They do get a 28-point win over the Buffaloes at home. They need to be hitting on all cylinders before they travel on the road to Seattle. Look for Oregon to start fast and roll over Colorado by four touchdowns or more in this battle. Let's keep it in the Pac-12. Let's look at that battle late night. Washington on the road against Arizona. Washington with a disappointing 10-point loss, 23-13, to as a 14.5-point favorite against Stanford. That was an opportunity for Washington to roll all over a Stanford offense that was entering that matchup, averaging 112 rushing yards per game and only 3.5 yards per carry. K.J. Costello did not play. Davis Mills backed up, and that offense for Stanford put up 482 yards on that Washington defense, Washington did not have an opportunity to challenge that Stanford uh, secondary that entering that matchup was giving up 287 passing yards to opposing quarterbacks. When you look at that offense for Washington, they only totaled in that loss 294 total yards, 203 through the air, and 88 on the ground. That was 291 total up against that defense in Stanford. That was a pathetic effort for the Huskies. They now make back-to-back -back road trips within the conference. What does Washington have to play for? This was a team that had their eyes on a Pac-12 title and a possible college football playoff appearance with their new quarterback, Jacob Eason. They now have two losses on the year and do have arch-rival Oregon on deck. I'm sorry. I think this is a flat spot for Washington, and I've been on Arizona all year. They were my surprise team at the start of the season to win their half of the Pac-12, and I'm not backing down now. When you look at Arizona, I picked them against Colorado as an underdog. They stepped up 35-30. to Khalil Tate did complete 31 of 41 passes, 404 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. This is an offense in Arizona that's averaging 255 rushing yards per game, passing for over 300 with Khalil Tate. 
Tate has completed 64%, 66% of his passes, nine touchdowns, five interceptions. He's come on. He looked sharp last week, spreading the football to 11 different wide receivers, including Peterson that broke free for a 75-yard touchdown reception in Folsom Field last week. I think Tucson will be rocking. I like the way the defensive front seven is playing for Arizona. Arizona has held every opponent under 160 yards rushing, with the exception of UCLA. I think they could force Washington into long third down situations. The secondary still playing very well for uh, Arizona. They're allowing 337 passing yards per game, but have shown consistency, made enough plays when the game was on the line against Colorado. Front seven only allowing 149 rushing yards per game. I think they strike the upset 38-31 to over the Huskies this coming Saturday night in Tucson. Let's keep it in the Pac-12. USC on the road against Notre Dame. Notre Dame has won three of the last five over the Trojans by an average margin of victory of 17.3 points per game. But I'm not sold on Notre Dame as a whole in terms of facing elite wide receivers. I know they got the victory uh, a couple of weeks ago against Virginia, got a victory last week as a 46-point favorite against Bowling Green, 52 to nothing, and did play very well against Georgia. But they haven't faced a team with elite wide receivers, not even the Georgia Bulldogs. Georgia has a lot of wide receiver inexperience this year. Teams have not challenged Notre Dame vertically uh, through the first five weeks of the season. They now are going to be challenged by a wide receiver core in St. Brown, Vaughns, and Pittman that have combined for 90 receptions, 1,153 receiving yards, and nine receiving touchdowns. If you watched that battle last year, Notre Dame picked up a 24 to 10, excuse me, 24 to 17 road win as a double digit favorite. They won but did not cover. But the wide receivers in that matchup with JT Daniels at the helm challenged that Notre Dame defense and made plays over the top. That was with Love in the secondary last year. I don't think Notre Dame's secondary is as good this year as it was last year, and I expect UC at USC to challenge Notre Dame and keep it within the number. I think Notre Dame wins. think it's high scoring, but this is a USC offense that's averaging 292 passing yards per game, they have speed to challenge Notre Dame on the perimeter, and I think they challenge it and almost pull up the upset. In the end, Notre Dame does get a 35-31 to win over USC, but it's a lot closer than people think in South Bend Saturday night. Another big battle takes place. It's the Red River shootout between Texas and Oklahoma. Texas has won four of the last six by an average margin of victory of 6.7 points per game. They picked up this victory in the Big 12 Championship 39-28. to Did lose the regular season game 48-45. to But I favor Jalen Hurts and the crew in this matchup. This is an Oklahoma team that picked up a 25-point win last week on the road in Lawrence, Kansas. They opened up a, a, an early third quarter lead, put in the reserves, and allowed Kansas to backdoor that matchup. I was on Kansas. If you followed the video, I picked the Jayhawks last week. But now Jalen Hurts expects to step up. He's not going to be rattled in this matchup. He's played in the Iron Bowl before. He's played in the college football playoff. And more importantly, has played in national championship games. He'll be into this matchup. He's completing over 70% of his passes, 14 touchdowns, one interception. He threw for 415 yards last week, three touchdowns, one interception. He can make plays on the ground and put pressure on the perimeter of Texas's defense. The secondary for Texas playing much better, six interceptions over the last two games. And when you look at it, though, statistically, they're still allowing over 300 passing yards to opposing quarterbacks. And for me, that's the matchup why I favor Oklahoma, coupled with the fact of Alex Grinch has done a fantastic job with Oklahoma's defense. They're flying to the football. They're in the right assignment. And I think they can challenge Sam Ellinger and force him into mistakes. I'm not sold on balance for Texas. I think it's solely solely revolves around Texas, uh, excuse me, quarterback Sam Ellinger. Colin Johnson will play in this matchup. Does have a hamstring injury. That's a cause of concern in this battle. 
I think Oklahoma does win this ball game by 18 points or more. I think they're the better team. They're only allowing 189 passing yards per game, only 149 on the ground, and that's not the strength of Texas this year. They're only averaging around 162 rushing yards per game. I think Oklahoma forces Ellinger and that offense to become one-dimensional. Jalen Hurts takes over, and Oklahoma wins this ball game by 18 points or more in Dallas Saturday afternoon. Another big battle is in the SEC. It's Georgia and South Carolina. Georgia has won four straight over the Gamecocks by an average margin of victory of 21 points per game. Picked up this victory last year on the road in uh, Columbia by a score of 41 to 14. They dominated in that battle. When you look at Georgia since 2016 against SEC opponents, Georgia is 17 and 4 overall and have won those 17 games by an average margin of victory of 22 points per game. When you look at Georgia as a whole, they're only allowing 58 rushing yards per game, but giving up 219 passing yards to opposing quarterbacks, and that's the matchup I look at going up against South Carolina's offensive quarterback, Ryan Holinsky. This is a rivalry game. It's an under-the-radar rivalry game that not a lot of people know about. A lot of these kids go to rival high schools. They go to the same high school, and they look to this matchup each and every year. When you look at South Carolina, they do get Dowdle, their running back that comes back for this matchup. And when you look at it, I think it comes down to the inexperience still of Georgia and that wide receiver core. I know Georgia's rushing for 252 on the ground. They're also passing for 262 through the air. But Jake Fromm has completed over 70% of his passes, only has eight touchdowns, no interceptions. When you look at the production for last year, Jake Fromm, 30 touchdowns, four interceptions. There are more controlled offense this year, not challenging defenses as much over the top. And I think that was evident last week on the road in Neyland Stadium against a mediocre Tennessee defense. This defense in South Carolina is a little bit better than people think. Only giving up 139 rushing yards to opposing offenses. They can run sideline to sideline. Think they can make enough plays to keep this game within the 25-point spread that was established earlier this week. So I look for Georgia to win, but South Carolina keeps this game very close. Georgia does pick up a 38-21 to win in this matchup Saturday afternoon in Sanford Stadium. Another big battle takes place within the Big Ten. It's Penn State on the road against Iowa. Penn State's won five straight over the Hawkeyes by an average margin of victory of 13.8 points per game. This is an offense that's balanced. They're rushing for 196 yards on the ground, passing for over 300, which Sean Clifford got a dominant 35-7 win over Purdue last week. Defense stepped up. They held Purdue to only 104 total yards, one of 15 on third down conversions. Now they go on the road to face a very difficult blue-collar team in Iowa that's coming off a 10 to 3 loss at the hands of Michigan Wolverines. I picked Michigan last week. They found a way to get it done. It was not easy in the big house, but they found a way to get a blue collar win over Iowa. And yet, Iowa was still within a position within the last minute of that ballgame from tying up that matchup against Michigan. They now come back home to face a team in Penn State. They were in striking distance last year. Penn State picked up this victory 30-24 to as a 5.5-point favorite, but Nate Stanley made a critical uh, bad decision at the goal line last year in Happy Valley. They were in a position to take the lead. He had an audible. There was miscommunication at the line of scrimmage, and he was trying to get Noah Fant in on a slant route. He threw a pick. That led to Penn State points, changed the whole momentum of that battle. Here's a couple of factors why I like Iowa in this matchup. First is there's a, a slight look ahead for Penn State against Michigan. I know you can never look ahead against Iowa, but there could possibly be a slight look ahead with Michigan on deck coming to Beaver Stadium against Penn State in two weeks. Coupled with the fact that Sean Clifford has played very well this year. He stepped up in his only road game against Maryland. They dominated that matchup 59 to nothing. 
but this is a different atmosphere under the lights in Kinnick Stadium than it was a couple of weeks ago in College Park. When you look at Iowa as a whole, they have a senior quarterback in Nate Stanley. He's completing 60, over 60% 60 of his passes. Uh, 1,223 yards, eight touchdowns, three interceptions. He's the more experienced quarterback heading into this matchup. And the front seven of Iowa still playing lights out. They held Michigan in check last week for much of the way. They made halftime adjustments. They're only allowing 86 rushing yards per game, only giving up 186 passing yards to opposing quarterbacks. They're a battle-tested team. I think they find a way. They strike the upset over Penn State 24-20. to Iowa gets the upset over the Nittany Lions this coming Saturday night in Kinnick Stadium. Last game on the docket is an ACC battle between number two Clemson and Florida State. Clemson has won four straight over Florida State by an average margin of victory of 19.7 points per game. Picked up this victory last year in Tallahassee by a score of 59-10. to 10. For me, Florida State's playing much better, but they're nowhere near where Clemson is. Statistically, let's just look at it. Since 2014, Clemson 43-4 and against ACC opponents. Let's delve a little bit deeper. The last 12 wins against ACC opponents, uh, Clemson, has won those games by an average margin of victory of 32.9 points per game. Last year, they won their nine ACC games by an average margin of victory of 35.8 points per game. When you look at the three wins this year over Georgia Tech, over uh, North Carolina, and um, Syracuse, they've won those ball games by an average margin of victory of 24.9 points per game. This is still the be one of the best teams in the country. I know they had a lackluster effort a couple of weeks ago against North Carolina. They've had a bye week to prepare. I think they straighten everything out. It comes down to the inefficiency and lack of consistency out of Florida State. Even though they're playing better, they're still not pounding the rock as much as Willie Taggart would have liked to. They're averaging close to about 145 yards per game. I still think they're a one-dimensional offense. I think the speed of Clemson's the difference, and they have the more complete quarterback and the more complete coach heading into this battle. I think when you look at this breakdown, I think Clemson dominates. It might be close in the first half, but in the second half, Clemson pulls away in this matchup and strikes a dominant win, reminiscent of last year. I think Clemson wins this ball game, forty-eight to seventeen over Florida State in this ball game. We're just getting started. Stay with me each and every week. Follow me this coming Saturday. College football today, nine a.m. to twelve p.m. Eastern time. Zumo TV channel seven nineteen or SportsGrid.com. College football is awesome. I just love talking about it. See you this weekend. Have a great week, everyone.